Hey, good afternoon, everybody. This is Patrick from the Poison Pen Bookstore, and we're here with another of our virtual events. And today, we're really pleased to have Ann Hillerman back with us. Um, she's going to be talking about her brand new book, Stargazy. And she's been kind enough, or she will be kind enough, to sign a big batch of them for us. And so uh, we should have those in sometime next week, I believe. Now we'll get them in at the end of this week, Patrick, I think. End of this week? It's not, it's not very far from Santa Fe to Phoenix. So. That's true. <laughs> so I'll put a link up in the, uh, in the comments field. And speaking of comments, if you have any questions uh, for Anne or Barbara, go ahead and put them in the comments field on Facebook, and I will pop up towards the end of the program to uh, ask your questions. But before we do that, I'm going to share the screen. Uh, let's see here. Here it is. Just a second. Yeah, here we go. And this is the very large array. So Barbara, you want to take it from here? I will, but actually, uh, first, let me welcome Anne. And this, this is actually the day before publication day. I have a little toast. I'm drinking to you, Ms. Sullivan. Oh, thank you to you, Barbara. And to everyone out there in Zoom land, thank you for joining us today. So this is Anne's sixth novel in the footsteps of her father, our much loved Tony Hillerman, and in fact, her sixth book launch at the Poison Pen. So it's really exciting for us. But the very large array that we just showed you is um, a big feature in Stargazer. So Anne, why don't you tell us a little bit about it before we plunge into the novel? Oh, well, I would be glad to. The Very Large Array is an astronomy facility in central New Mexico. Um, it's, what, there are, it's one of only two international facilities that listens to signals coming from space. They, they listen to uh, radio waves. Uh, the Very Large Array was one of the first uh, astronomy centers to discover black holes. Um, they, they do a lot of international research they make the uh, data that's collected by their by the uh, telescope telescopic disks available to researchers um, all over the globe. Um, and they also have a lovely visitor center. They have a tape, uh, a movie that has Jodie Foster narration that talks about what they do. Once a, before COVID, uh, once a month, they would do tours, public tours of the facility. Uh, there are uh, more than a dozen of those big telescopes mounted on railroad tracks, and they move them back and forth depending on what part of the dark sky they're trying to listen to. So uh, they also are affiliated with SETI, the group that listens for communications from uh, intelligence from outer space. So it seemed to me that there were so many mysteries alone in the work that the Very Large Array does that it was the perfect place to set a mystery. And besides that, they're less than an hour away from a part of the Navajo reservation known as the Alamo Navajo community. So since because my detectives are Navajo police officers, it made sense to have a crime happen in uh, on the Alamo reservation or involved with people from the Alamo reservation that also might somehow intertwine with the very large array. Large array. So. Well, you did it absolutely brilliantly. For those of you who may be driving uh, through New Mexico, uh, it's about 50 miles west of Socorro. And I have passed it if you um, are driving on 60 across New Mexico, which is really good because when you leave Payson, you go to Pie Town, which is an absolutely great stop. And then you carry on through, what is it, Datchel, I think, and I'm trying to remember other town. But anyway, all Amato of this. Amato and Magdalena. Yeah. Right. It's yep. a beautiful drive. Um, it is. It's a beautiful drive. It's a great way to go to Santa Fe if you drive and then you drive into Socorro and take 25 north to Santa Fe. But there's this big kind of plain because, you know, there are lots of wonderful buttes, mesas, mountains and so forth in New Mexico. But the very large array sits there on a plane and it's so neat to be driving and you see these great big things you just saw like gigantic mushrooms that move and they rear up out of the out into that New Mexico sky, which is one of the most beautiful skies ever. The color is so beautiful. Usually there are clouds. There's the gorgeous red rocks. I mean, it's fabulous. And I think Anne was a genius for not only picking this site, but 
she manages to tell you about what happens at a very large array without boring you stiff. I was so impressed. I mean, it's the most, it's the clearest explanation that I have had for what these astrophysicists and radio uh, signal guys are doing. And it all comes to you wrapped up in this perfectly wonderful mystery. So, wow. Well, thank you. You know, the other thing that really appealed to me about using the Very Large Array and the Alamo Nation as sites for the, for the story was that I could get a little bit into Navajo Star Lore. And it's very, I think those of us who uh, went to mainstream schools in the United States probably got the Greek version of astronomy, you know, the Pleiades, the, the Big Dipper, um, Orion, all of that. And the Navajo view of the stars is really much more expansive. Where we may see Orion, they see Orion. Uh, uh, they call him the the Great Warrior, and then all of the animals that he was that he was fighting. It's and I think it's kind of the the viewpoint that comes from people who spend a lot of time outside, and who also have a very rich life of stories. So it was fun for me to to do that research and try to somehow intertwine it into the mystery without uh, without too much detail, but just enough to kind of give the plot some flavor. Oh, I think you did it brilliantly. I truly enjoyed it. The other thing that's really, in, I think, intriguing about Stargazer is that there's movement in the lives of all of the characters. So we have Joe Leaphorn, who's fighting a phobia, and um, you know. Part of part of the suspense is, is he going to overcome it or is he just going to sit back and be stodgy and, you know, because he's been recovering and for a long time, hasn't he, from the injury that you gave him, you cruel woman, and it's very, in your first book, I mean, you, you knocked him out and he's been sort of trying to come back ever since. That's right. And in the book I wrote before this, uh, Tale Teller, he's come back pretty well, but he, I mean, there still is some impairment. And I think what happens in Stargazer, um, you kind of, I, you kind of see Joe sort of taking charge of his own life again, which, I mean, it made me happy to write that. And I, I hope the readers enjoy it. I had a lot of fun with um, taking that character and giving him a few little subtle twists. I did too. It was really good to see him because after all, he was, you know, for those of us who have read Hillerman's from the blessing way forward, such as me, um, Joe Leaphorn was our, you know, our initial guide. He was our, I mean, I'll never forget picking up the blessing way and reading. I was just so astonished by what I learned from it, but there was Joe. And you know, uh, March of last year, March of, of 2020, was the 50th anniversary of the publication of The Blessing Way. So Joe Leaporn has been around a long time. And when I thought that maybe I could make the transition from nonfiction to fiction, one of the challenges I had was Joe Leaporn because he, as you know, Barbara, he was such a beloved character. And I thought if I'm going to raise Bernadette Manuelito to the position of being a full-fledged crime solver, uh, I have to give her a big crime. And so it seemed to me that that big crime should involve Joe Leaphorn. And I don't want to say too much for people who haven't read the series, but a lot of people were horrified at what happened, but everything worked out okay. Well, it did. Well, we have done a slight spoiler in that Joe is still here in book six. So you, know, you, you can read the first one. Was that, I'm trying to remember, what is the first one? Is it the spider? Spider Woman's Daughter. The Spider Woman's Daughter. So when you read it, um, we've just, dissipated a tiny bit of suspense, but tough. Um, and then we have Jim Chi. And uh, Jim, who is married to Bernie, has had his own adventures over the course of the books. Your dad gave him a number of challenges. But right now, I find it really fun that um, he's been shoved into an administrative post, which means he actually has to supervise his wife, which is not a very happy position for him to be in. So. You know, you decided to take Jim and shake up his life some too, didn't you? I did. I did. You know, that's the that's the great thing about fiction. You can turn people's lives upside down. And then if you decide, oh, this doesn't quite work, you can just turn them right side up again. Yeah, I, I, um, I've always liked the character of, of Jim Chi. He's been, he was one of my favorites when I uh, started writing the series back with Spider Woman's Daughter. And uh, he's had more active roles in other books, but this time I thought it would be interesting to, sh to shift him from kind of a man of action 
to a man who is having to deal with other people's problems and, and make decisions. And again, it was, it was uh, a lot of, uh, there was a lot of joy for me in, in writing this book and um, discovering new aspects of these characters who I have loved for a very long time. Well, it really comes across. And as I said, everybody's life is now moving. And that's important in a series that you don't let them ossify in some role. So Bernie, Bernie has, she's going to be the lead investigator. We'll get to that in a moment. But Bernie is torn between continuing on in the role that she's in and maybe uh, challenging herself a bit more with becoming, what, a detective, an investigator? I'm trying to remember. What job is it that she's flirting with? Right, a detective, a crime scene investigator, whatever however you however you wanna wanna call it, yeah. Right. Instead of instead of being on patrol duty and dealing with um, dog bite cases and missing kids, uh, investigating more more serious crimes, and it's a it's a hard decision for her. I mean, she has a lot of a lot of creativity and a lot of energy. At the same time, she's very focused on, like a lot of professional women are focused on the other side of her life, on being a good daughter, on on. Uh, kind of lassoing her sister who tends to have some wild streaks and on, on also making sure that her marriage works. So it's an interesting, I think so many uh, women deal with that, the professional challenge and the personal challenge. And so it, again, it was, it was fun to give Bernie a little space to kind of think about this as she's working on a big crime and basically acting as a detective. It is. Um, I thought you showed some really interesting stress on their marriage. You know, she uncomfortable with supervising Bernie, but wishing she'd um, obey him more because, you know, she's she's kind of ignoring some of his directives and Bernie going, you know, being mad with she, but at the same time, um, you know, appreciating his difficulties. And, and it helps, I think, Anne, that she's on the road in this book because because of where the very large array is and that um, a lot of the crime takes place over, as you say, in the Alamo Reservation. Um, she's driving a lot in this book. Yeah. So it gives her time to sit in the car and think. Right, right, right. And you know, my, my dad used that convention a lot in his books too. And it comes because the Navajo Nation is so vast and it takes a long time to get from, from Alamo to Shiprock, which is where Bernie's basically stationed. She has a lot of time to think. And uh, early in the book, she also uses that time to interview uh, a woman who has confessed to a crime. This is Bernie's old college roommate. And Bernie has a deep suspicion that this woman is lying. And so she uses that time in the car to try to, to try to understand why she would lie about such a serious crime. And it, it, as for me as a writer, it worked out really well to have that convention of having them in the car with a lot, a lot of time to talk. And I can talk a little bit about the scenery, but I think it, I, at least from my perspective as the author, that whole uh, setup worked really well. And then you have the beautiful scenery we can talk about, so. Right, well, I mean, it's always been wonderful to read about this scenery, but you know, I can remember that um, when there was a lot of discussion about turning your dad's books into um, video, into television, one of the problems was that there, was a, there wasn't enough action. There was a lot of interior thought. There was a lot of gorgeous scenery and description, but you know, the, there wasn't enough action to drive a movie. Um, and, and so, I mean, I, I think that is something when you, when you choose the kind of um, storytelling that you did in this book, while there are exciting things, there are long passages that would not adapt well to a visual form, but are wonderful to read. And maybe that's the reason that I still prefer books over, over film. Yeah, me too, me too. <laughs> So it's lovely to do that. Shiprock is up, um, what is kind of north central New Mexico? I've been through it, I don't know how many times. Coming down from Durango is a general rule, heading yeah, down to Santa Fe. Northwestern New Mexico. It's that whole area they call the Four Corners where you have New Mexico, Utah, Col yeah. Colorado, and Arizona all coming together there. And is, is it one of those old volcano cones? Do I remember right? Because it seems to me that there's some, Gee, I'm, I'm trying to remember, I, I slept through 
geography at Sanford. It was one of my great regrets. It was an eight o'clock in the morning course and I hardly ever got there. And if I had known I was gonna spend my life in the Southwest, yeah, you know, I would have gotten up and paid more attention because geology is so important, but I blew it. But in any case, I think that there is, and I've seen one in Alaska, believe it or not, on your way to the Kenai Forts, if you get off um, in Alaska um, on a cruise ship and head for the fjord land. There's one too, and I think what it is, is the interior cone of the volcano, isn't it, where the rest of it is kind of worn away? Yeah, that's exactly right, exactly And right. it does look like a ship, just because, you know, it looks like a, a ship with full sails, an old ship kind of out there in the desert sailing along. It's wonderful, yeah. um, and it rises up, and you can see it for a really long time, but so it's fun to go from that and drive all the way over towards eastern New Mexico and the very large array, this wonderful science thing. Do they go into Socorro in the book? I'm trying to remember. They do, yeah. They the, do. Okay. yeah the the um, deputy sheriff uh, with whom Bernie is working is stationed in Socorro. So right. yeah, there's some scenes. I don't talk much about Socorro, but there are, yeah, there are some scenes there. I had a chance to explore some restaurants there to, you know, make sure every, everything was authentic. Well, yeah. Socorro is at the confluence of uh, 25 and 60, but also the, the Rio Grande, the big river, um, flows along and 25 follows the big river going north up towards Albuquerque and Santa Fe. So, you know, it's a, it's really a, a nice route to go. There are various ways to get from Phoenix to Santa Fe and I've always liked going across Highway 60. Um, yeah. It's particularly fun if you, if you head over to Eastern Arizona and go to Silver City. And then you can come up and, and go. I mean, you've got to have two days to do it that way. It's not not a fast trip, but it's yeah. a gorgeous, gorgeous trip. But anybody coming from Phoenix can easily do it in a day. I mean, even with even with stopping for lunch and some and some sightseeing. Oh yeah. No, absolutely. I my best time is seven hours when I really put the <laughs> But that means like one rest stop on the, on the trip. Anyway, um, so Bernie, um, this whole thing begins when Bernie goes to serve a warrant. Um, directed to do that by her husband, and and it goes wrong. She doesn't actually manage to serve the warrant. So there's a there's a aggravation right there at the very beginning. That's right. And of course, she's especially embarrassed because now Jim Chi is acting as her boss. And so, I mean, it's, failures are always embarrassing, but doubly embarrassing when you have to tell somebody who you love that you that you screwed up. Yeah, so in a way, it's it was a relief for Bernie to get out of the Shiprock office and be able to go down to Socorro for a few days and, and work on this other case. One thing that inspired me as I was thinking about Stargazer was the whole notion of, of lying and little lies that we tell to people we love because we want to protect them or because we don't want to hurt their feelings. And that is sort of the situation that Bernie sees herself in when this uh, woman who she knows, and she hasn't been in touch with her for a while, but she's confessed uh, basically to murdering her estranged husband. And Bernie is thinking, no, people change, but not that much. And I cannot imagine that this woman would have done it. And the woman, of course, doesn't want to explain it. She's just saying, I did it. You know, let's get on with it. I don't want to talk about it which uh, gives Bernie an extra challenge of, of making this one, proving this woman's innocence without, this, without the woman's cooperation. So that, that was all fun for me to write too, to kind of write that, uh, that in, internal dialogue that's going, going on with Bernie and then with the, uh, with the deputy sheriff who is uh, uh, more involved with the case because the body was found in her jurisdiction. So your decision not to write from Lee Porter Cheese as the major character, but to bring Bernie up as your primary lead. You're really happy with that. I mean, we're six books into that. Do you think that that's worked really well? Yes, yes. I try to alternate, um, have different, like the in the Telltaller, Joe Leaporn, the, the book before this, Joe Leaporn was the main crime solver. And in uh, Rock with Wings, Jim Chi had a big part of solving that story. And the book that I just finished that'll be out next year is basically a Jim Chi book with a pretty strong Bernie story, but Chi drives the plot in, in that book. 
Uh, and yeah, it's been awfully fun to kind of juggle these these three main crime solvers that who my dad created so well. Two of he two he created, and then Bernie, who I basically brought up from a minor character to being a, a, a major detective. It's been really fun to alternate between between their points of view. And I think it's, I think the readers have enjoyed it too. I get a lot of very positive comments from readers saying that they they were they didn't know this about Jim Chi or they were glad to see Joe Lee Porn in a, in a different light. So I, I think if a writer's having fun, readers kind of have fun with the with the with the results too. Absolutely. And that certainly was the case in this book. Your, you know, your enjoyment of it is extremely contagious as one reads it, one gets, um, one gets caught up in it. So um, as I said, I, I, I love, those are the parts I loved. I love learning about the very large array. I loved all the enthusiasm. And I love watching the characters' lives begin to shift again. And, you know, that makes you feel like the next book will be carried even further forward in whatever directions are going on. So are you feeling more confident, Anne? I mean, you and I, way back before you ever started writing this, had some discussions about whether you really wanted to, um, to take on this idea of continuing your dad's work. Oh, I'm absolutely in love with it. I mean, it was with, uh, with Stargazer especially, I really could not wait to get started in the morning. I mean, sometimes um, I'm lucky that I have a dog who knows when it's 10 o'clock and she comes and reminds me that I have to get up and, you know, not, I can't sit there all day, but yeah, it was, and I think particularly during the pandemic to be working on the revisions, uh, I know for a lot of people that sort of, of concentrated isolation is difficult, but I sort of considered it a gift. I mean, as much as I love to go out to lunch with my friends and to, you know, have a drink after work, it was kind of nice to just wake up and look at my calendar and the only thing on it was write and walk the dog. So, and, oh, and do laundry, those three things. Sure, that makes yeah, sense. So, yeah, it was... It's, I mean, it's, it sounds like kind of a weird and screwy life. And I think that's why not everybody can be a writer. You have to have sort of that, oh, I guess really the passion for your characters as if they were your friends too and wanting to tell their stories the best way you can. And then also thinking of the, the people who are going to be reading it and really wanting to treat them with, with respect and uh, with understanding that they that their uh, appreciation for what you write is part of the, the stimulation to go on to the next book. Well, playing with imaginary friends has been, you know, um, it, it's a wonderful part of childhood and it's nice you can continue it as an adult, um, which, you know, not, not everybody gets to do. So wonderful. Not everybody gets away with it either. <laughs> no. But you had another advantage because, you know, in the many times that you and I have gotten together in Santa Fe, your late husband, Don, did wonderful photography. And in fact, I'm trying to think, was it two years, three years ago? Anyway, when he was still with us, the um, Santa Fe Library had a wonderful exhibit of um, several of his photographs. But, you know, so obviously you, you're really familiar with the whole New Mexico landscape. Um, and you and you and Don actually did a couple of nonfiction books together, didn't you, with images and words? And in, in fact, we did the last nonfiction we bu book we did was called Tony Hillerman's Landscape, right. and that book really was. In fact, we did a slideshow at Poison Pen yes, for, you did. Of, that, of that book, and that book really was the the launch pad for me for continuing the mystery series. And part of, part of my motivation had to do with events like the one at Poison Pen, where Don and I would, I, I would show the photos and we, some pe people would ask him, you know, what cameras do you use? What exposures, blah, blah, blah. And they, then they would often ask me, so did your dad have any other novels in the series? Was there anything, you know, almost ready, anything at the publisher, anything that could be dusted off, spruced up and released as another Jim Chi Joe Leaphorn story? And I would say, no, dad took care of business. And then I could really read the person's disappointment. And often the person would say, oh, well, now I'm gonna reread the whole series again. And those characters were like my friends. And after a while, it dawned on me that I shared that same sense of loss. And even though I could never, um, my father would never come back. 
I could breathe some life, new life into the characters that I loved. And so, yeah, so Don, the book that Don and I did together and all the travels we did through Navajo land really were instrumental in um, helping me decide that I could continue this series. And not only that I could continue it, but that really I had a lot of passion for it. So yeah, I'm very, I'm very grateful to Don for that. Well, I am too. And in fact, I remember us talking, you know, after your event with the slideshow with Don for Johnny Hellerman's Landscapes. And I remember we had a big conversation and I really encouraged you to, um, to do it because as you say, a tremendous sense of loss and there was so much left for these characters, so much life left for them. It's one of the tragedies, you know, for, for readers when you lose an author, it's not this, you, you didn't just lose the person, but you lost the whole universe and the characters that the author created. And so um, for something as much loved as, as the Lee Porn and Chi books and your dad's books, uh, readers I think were just delighted at the idea. Um, of being able to continue it. Now I have other good news, which is in September, I think it was gonna be October, um, James McGrath is going to publish a biography of your dad. And I had a wonderful day sitting home here with, in my dining room, talking to him, memories of your dad, um, my own collection of your dad's works, cause I have, I have them all. Um, and I'm really looking forward, cause I remember, I remember doing one of the, best events ever in 31 years with your dad. I mean, best of all, not just with your dad, but a great event uh, for seldom disappointed. Oh. And, you know, it was such a wonderful, um, you know, autobiography, but not, not a formal one, you know, um, of his life. And I think I might've told you this, but we, we were in the Scottsdale library and it was just packed. It's like 300 people, or and that was all the people that could crowd in. The fire department is probably cursing over in the corner because we're all over capacity, whatever. And it was so exciting. And, you know, your dad and I got on stage, and I went up to the front and I introduced him. And I went back and sat down, and your dad walked up to the front of the stage. I've always remembered this. And he looked out at the audience, and then he turned around and he looked at me and he said, I can't do this. And he realized his hearing had so far left him that he couldn't, he couldn't talk to this group by himself. So I got up. I was planning to be just furniture for the whole event. You know? I got up and walked up there. And the two of us stood there for, I think, like an hour and a half and talked about um, his childhood, you know, his memories of his mother, his war service, the wounds that he got, his whole career. And it was... It was just magical to share that with him in a way that, you know, I, I certainly didn't expect. And it reminded me that I never do one of these events without having read the book. <laughs> you really have to have read the book in order, in order to, uh, to do a good job. And I, uh, I love Seldom Disappointed. I thought it was wonderful. So I'm going to be really interested to see what the official biography how it compares and how it differs from your dad's story of his own, of his life. Have you read the book so uh, as yet? I have, I have read think? it. Uh, uh, James McGrath Morris does a fine job. One thing I especially, especially appreciated about his book is that he gives my mother more credit. I mean, really? my mother really was very, very brilliant and very organized and 100% supportive of my dad. But also she was a, an avid, avid reader. I mean, she read, I bet she read two or three books a week and she kept little notebooks with every title and like a little, a little plot summary and then what her opinion of it was. So I think anybody wanting to be a writer could not have had a better partner than my, than, than my mom and dad had together. So I was very pleased that uh, James McGrath Morris gave, gave my mom some credit. He and I uh, did a lot of uh, conversation about that book. And yeah, it was, it was lovely. It made me again appreciate how lucky I was to have had a, a father who was so, not only a, a good father, but just such a wonderful storyteller. And I think a lot of that, um, a lot of the passion that he had for stories then kind of gave me permission to grow up to be a storyteller myself. 
I think it was just such a wonderful gift that I got from dad and from the universe. And I think that actually dad, dad's fans kind of, you know, the carryover, the ripple effect kind of goes out to them too. So yeah, I'm excited about, about that biography. Can't, I can't wait to, to see what people's reaction is to it. Me too. I have a printout of it over here. He sent me a copy of the final draft, but as I am um, somewhat overwhelmed <laughs> at the moment with other things to read, I probably won't get to it for a little while. But, you know, it's one of those things I say, but it's a treat. Um, you know, you have to do X, Y, and Z, and then you allow yourself um, a little indulgence. And for me, reading um, reading about your dad, as, as he has written it, will certainly be one of those. So you say you've completed another book. That's always great news for fans when watching this to know that there will be a book out next year. What yeah. did you decide? What tell? Just tell us a little bit about the location because that's well, part of the fun of reading these. And this is set in a location that dad never used and that I haven't used before. Hmm. It talks about Antelope Canyon, which is near Lake Powell. And then it talks about Rainbow Bridge, which is a which also is, is at Lake Powell. It, it, there was a lot of controversy when Lake Powell was being built about protecting Rainbow Bridge because it's a very sacred site to the Navajo, to the Hopi, to the Zuni, to um, a lot of the tribes, the Paiutes, a lot of the tribes out there really hold that place in high, high esteem. And the idea that it would be now visited by people in houseboats did not sit well with a lot of the tribes. Yeah. So anyway, that and then uh, Navajo Mountain, which is a Navajo community um, near Lake Powell. Those are those are the main settings for for the, the new book. The working title of it is The Sacred Bridge. And uh, my editor uh, at HarperCollins agreed to the title before she'd read the manuscript. So we'll see if that title sticks. I, I really like it because it works uh, on with the story on, on many different levels. But you know, sometimes editors are even smarter than authors, so we'll see. We'll see what happens. But anyway, that book was due April first, and what you're saying about kind of holding things out there as dessert, I, I wasn't really able to think again about Stargazer until I had submitted the manuscript for Sacred Bridge. So then I went back to Stargazer, and it's like all of it. All of a sudden, discovering that your baby is a toddler, and now it, it you know, can talk, and it's, you know, it's not crawling anymore; it's walking. So it was really fun to sort of rediscover this book, not having read it for a year, and I think I like it even better not having had a, a little distance from it. So that is such a good point. And when we have these conversations, it's hard for readers to realize that the author has almost always written another book in the interval and oftentimes can't fully remember, um, you know, what, what the book was about. So I learned that very early on, probably 30 years ago, that it was way better to have a conversation. So that when the author got a question and, and looked, you know, that like your dad, what that during the headlines look like, what? Um, one of us anyway would know, would know the answer. So it's been, it's been a lot of fun. I didn't go into book selling to be a performer. But it's kind of turned out that way. And, and Patrick, who's doing such a wonderful job with our Zoom events, has become a producer as well as a performer. And, you know, that it's interesting how life takes you places that you didn't expect to go, isn't it? It certainly is. And I think um, all of these Zoom talks have been uh, beneficial to authors in ways that I wouldn't have expected. I mean, I love, love being with a live audience. And I was always shy. That was a, another surprise to me becoming a writer that I really kind of liked the, the performing part. But the good thing about Zoom is that people don't have to be in Scottsdale. I mean, you, I'm sure you have people from all over the world who watch these. And, and for us authors, it's a great way to kind of introduce ourselves to readers who maybe wouldn't wouldn't have the time or maybe wouldn't even think they had the interest to actually go physically to a bookstore. So I, you know, I think there's, there's been all kinds of interesting things that have happened as our world has changed over the last year. Well, I think you're right. I mean, we, we actually did our first video of a live event in the store in 1995 and we've been doing it forever. So people, all, all of the events you did with us before Zoom were always on Facebook Live except that you and I were sitting talking to each other in the bookstore rather than at home as we are. And yes, it does lead to a big international audience. And I've been really surprised if we look back at the data for some of these Zoom events we have done, in a few of them, 
hardly anyone is actually in the United States. They're all over the world, which means some of them are like staying up all night or, you know, the time is hardest part of Zoom events are time zones. You have no idea how hard time zones are for people to figure out. But yeah, it um, it's wonderful in that sense and wonderful for authors. Of course, it's a question for us because it's great if we have 11 people in Pune, Indo, India watching this, but they are not 11 people who are going to buy a book. So we have to figure out, you know, how we can do all this and yet still sell books to people to support the store because after all, that is the way that, you know, that the store raises revenue is through sales. We haven't. Um, so then there are all kinds of questions coming along if, if this goes on in different ways, you know, do we start charging fees to watch and, you know, how does that work? And, and you know, how, how do you compensate the, the audience? I had a very funny conversation with Dennis Lahane, who's also part of your publishing company. And he had a 20th anniversary of Mystic River um, on, back a little while ago. So we did an event to celebrate that. And we recall that he was in the poison pen when his book hit the New York Times bestseller list and, you know, movie news, and it was just going to be huge. And your publisher and his offered him a chance to tear up his contract and write a new one. And Dennis's choice, which, which we talked about, uh, Dennis's choice was not money. Dennis's choice was to have no further deadlines. So he could have all the time that he needed to write his future books. But here's the reason I brought that up. When he told his agent that that was his choice, his agent said, how do I get 15% of that? Of no <laughs> and you know, that, that is the crowning problem is, you know, how do you monetize so that agents can continue to be agents and authors can continue to write books and, and still have a life and bookstores can continue to survive. And I do think this whole thing with COVID and all these new technologies, we all have to start thinking in, in new ways. But my hope is that next spring, you'll be back at the poison pen and we'll be doing it live. But at the same time, we will be doing the video. So what I hope is that the audience for the video will be much, much larger because there's only so many people that can actually get to the store, as you point out. Yeah. So I think we may find that events have a different dimension when they go back to live uh, than they had before. Yeah, I think I think you're absolutely right at that. I, I think that comment about deadlines is interesting. I find actually that a deadline is wonderful stimulus and it kind of stirs up my my creativity. I mean, yeah, I'm bopping along, bopping along, bopping along. And then all of a sudden I realize, oh my gosh, I have to submit this manuscript in six weeks. And something happens and my inner, I have more energy, I have more focus. So if, if I were, if Harper were to say to me, take as long as you want, I, I don't think that would be a good thing. And that may be because of my background in, in journalism. Yeah. I think I'm just so used to having a deadline as motivation. But I find too, um, I have Stargazer here, one of the few copies that actually has been, has been delivered. But I found uh, work, working on this book that having that deadline really, uh, really was vital to me. And I realized about three fourths of the way through that I had the wrong villain. And I think, <laughs> and it was, I, it, yeah, it was, a, it was a real shock to me. But the good thing was I thought, well, maybe this will be a shock to the reader too. So I, I went back and you know planted a few more clues about who turned out to be the right villain but basically just kind of left all the other clues I'd planted for the wrong villain. And I think if I had had more time, I might've rewritten the whole darn thing. And it would have been, it probably would have still been a good book, but I think this one is better because it had that kind of twisty little, little part to it because I knew I couldn't redo it. And I kind of had to just uh, punt, I guess, make the best of it. That's so interesting. You know, everybody has a different writing process, but, you know, based on my, my own academic life and so forth, terror is a, is a great incentive and a deadline, a deadline can't produce that. So really good thing. You know what? Let's call Patrick up from the briny deep or from wherever hole, the black hole that he's in and see whether we have fans who have questions. There he is. Hi. Um, yes, we do. Let's see here. Lots of people are watching, by the way. And, uh, 
quite a few of these people are just saying, you know, how much they appreciate uh, your books and what a wonderful job you've done of continuing your father's legacy. I have a lot of comments like that. Um, this is a good one, though. Uh, Rosemary asks, do you ever think when you're working on the books, um, kind of what your father would think? Do you feel more of a connection with him when you're working on his characters? I absolutely do. And sometimes when I'm, if I'm having, having a, either if I'm, if I'm in a section that's really challenging me and say it's a, a, a point of the plot where I could go either way, often I think, what, how would my dad handle this? And likewise, if on one of, on those beautiful days when things are just flowing, I kind of look up to heaven and I say, thanks dad for that, for the inspiration. So yeah, it goes both ways. And I really do feel close to him when, when I'm writing because I'm, you know, in his, in his shoes, you know, living in the, the world that he created so many years ago. And I also feel closer to my mom because she was my dad's first editor. And she really encouraged me on Spider Woman's Daughter, my first novel. And she was the one who came up for the name of the of Rock with Wings, my second novel. So yeah, it's it was I it's really an unexpected pleasure to have, besides having the, the joy of the creativity, to have the the, the family connections. So Thanks for that question, Rosemary. I forget to talk about that. Um, let's see, Anna Marie asks, she says, my husband and I have enjoyed all the Hillerman books over the years. Uh, characters, context, and the new development of characters is all very rich. They are classics that will, will last. Um, her question, could you talk a little bit more about Bernie and her development and your inspiration for her? I'd be glad to. So when I, uh, had the idea that I wanted to continue the series. I knew that I could never be Tony Hillerman. So I, I thought I have to figure out some way to give it a new twist without being too bizarre. You know, it had to be in the, in the guidelines that dad had set, but something different. So the reader would think, oh yeah, this isn't Tony, but it still is pretty fun. So I had always liked the character of Bernadette Manuelito. And frankly, I thought that dad didn't, didn't develop her as well as he could have. He kind of left her as sort of a, oh, rather inept, but charming cop who basically was in love with her sergeant and was a nice girl, but not, not a professional policewoman. And so I thought this, this character needs to um, stand on her own feet and solve a big crime. So that really was uh, how I thought I could continue the series uh, with, without just being a, a poor imitation of what my father had done. And you know, I was talking earlier about my mother. Um, when I had the idea that maybe, and I have to give Barbara credit, she was very encouraging to me about, about attempting to do this. So anyway, when, after I had written a draft of the first novel, I uh, showed it to my mom. And my mom was a very smart and gentle critic. And I thought if she says like, oh honey, this is kind of interesting that I would just put it in a drawer and forget about it. But in fact, she said, I love this book and I think your dad would be proud of you. And so that really gave me a great incentive to uh, continue writing about Bernadette Manuelito and to you know, develop the characters that dad had created, but kind of taking them on, on a journey that now I was in charge of. So yeah, I guess, I, I hope that answers the question. Definitely. Um, let's see here. I'm gonna paraphrase this one. There's a question that, uh, well, Joyce says, uh, several years ago, we took a driving tour of the Southwest and tried to visit as many of the landmarks and locations in the novels. Those memories have really enhanced reading the new editions. Um, and since, you know, landscape is such an important fundamental part of these books, do you find yourself um, going back on the road and, and uh, searching for new locations all the time or? Well, that's been one of the real challenges of the pandemic. You know, the, the COVID hit the Navajo Nation oh, enormously hard, lots of tragedy, lots of devastation. And to keep their people safe, um, uh, President Jonathan Nez basically closed it, closed the Navajo Nation to visitors. 
So the book that I just finished is set uh, on places of the Navajo Nation that I have really not spent much time in. So I had to use YouTube videos and photographs and my, my memories uh, to do the draft that I submitted. And I have fingers and toes crossed that come May, things will open and I can actually go to those places and make the descriptions a little stronger. But yeah, I, I find enormous inspiration from being in the landscape that I write about. You know, you can see it on the internet, but you don't know what the air smells like. You don't know what the sun feels like. You don't, you don't get the sounds all, I mean, some, maybe you get highway noise, but it's not like you're, you know, standing there for half an hour, really soaking it in. So yeah, that's crucial to my writing process and I have really, really missed it. So I'm, I'm praying that things will be better for the Navajo Nation and they will be uh, able to open again to visitors so I can uh, you know, talk to people and do some more in-depth research for the book that I just finished. Now you mentioned um, your background in journalism. Can you maybe talk a little bit about what sort of work you did in that field? Sure, I'd be glad to. I started out as a copy editor, which is, is a good job for anyone who wants to be a serious writer because you get to see all of the other people's mistakes and also everything that they do that they do well. But you get to deal with, with redundancy, with poor quotes, with disorganization, all of that stuff. So that was my first job. And then I uh, did arts and education reporting for a while. I did some political reporting. I did some police reporting, which turned out to be remarkably handy for somebody who's writing about cops. And then I was uh, editorial page editor, both for the Santa Fe New Mexican and the Albuquerque Journal. And that was interesting because it also then uh, exposed me to kind of the, the business side of, of, uh, of, of the journalism business. So yeah, it, it, and it, the, I think one of the, the other two really good things were deadlines, you know, in journalism, you can't say, oh, I need another, I need another day. No, it's, you know, it's whatever you have, you have is, is gone, you know, and you just have to say next time I'll do better. And the other thing is working with editors. You can't be too sensitive to criticism. You know, sometimes you just say thank you, even if you don't agree with it. And, you know, and, but also you learn when it's time to draw your line in the sand and say, no, no, this is, this is important to me and you can't change it. So I think all of that was excellent preparation for, although I didn't know it at the time, excellent preparation for, for moving on to writing book length manuscripts and dealing with other editors and other copy editors. Did your dad have any kind of writerly advice? Were you when you were starting out in that profession or was that uh, not something that really came up? Well, two things. He, he did not believe in writer's block. He thought that a lot of the problem when people got when people got stuck was that they just were maybe too lazy to think through what the what what was going on there. And I think I think writer's block does not go away if you walk away from if you walk away from from the problem. So I, I agreed with him on that. And the other thing that he said was that writing should be fun. He said, other if it's not fun, you shouldn't do it because and and this is true. So many people who are wonderful writers really can't make any money at it. So I think the joy of the creative process has to be a big part of the motivation. And I know that was true, true for my dad. You know, he did a lot of, of writing before he became, you know, Tony Hillerman in, in, in Flashing Lights. A lot of writing that didn't, you know, he didn't get paid for it. He just did it for love. So those two things were, were probably the best advice he gave me. And then just his example. I mean, seeing how devoted he was to it how seriously he took it, but also the, the joy that the process gave him. Well, that's really about it, Barbara. I, I put out another, uh, I'm trying to get some more questions coming in, but do you have any more? Um, no, I was thinking how nice Anne was to say that I was supportive. The truth is I bullied her. <laughs> so she's being awfully nice to me, but I just, I was just so, um, it just seemed like it was the same thing she had to do, but of course it was her choice, not mine. But I really, really felt like um, that whole universe that Tony had created um, still, still had 
needed to be explored, that there were lots of stories there and really only Anne could do it. A, a, a stranger coming in, it, you know, without, without her family history, without knowing her dad, would not be able to, to bring the same magic to it, the same sympathy to it. One of the things that, um, you know, we're in an age of cultural appropriation, and yet I don't remember anybody ever saying, you know, that Tony should not have been writing about the Navajo. He was so loving and so, um, you know, his portraits were so real and so sympathetic um, that there wasn't any pushback that I ever saw. And do, do you recall whether your father was ever criticized for writing about the Navajo? You know, that's a real interesting question, Barbara. The only people who criticized him were people who'd never read his books. Aha. Uh -huh. Well, you know, it's become kind of a thing at the moment that you can't write it if you're not living it. And I don't, I mean, I, I am so appalled by that because I mean, that's the whole point of fiction. You know, fiction is about imagination and, you know, creating universes and, and you know making stories and so forth and you don't have to be that person i mean you know science fiction writers i mean are they really martians or you know, <laughs> i mean you just it just is enraging to me that um that there's pressure on people and i've i've had some writers talk to me about that how hard it has been for them to not be able to pursue a story because you know their publisher or whatever feels like that will be straying into difficult territory. So um, I think I think the fact that you are a Hillerman and you know definitely the the custodian of your dad's world and your dad's legacy um, is is a very good thing because it doesn't allow any of that any of that in. Actually I have a question. Uh, and I, I remember that your your dad used to say, and I'm not sure if I'm remembering this correctly, but the thief of time I remember was uh, one of his favorites uh, of his own books. Do you have a favorite or do you have several favorites that you go back to? Uh, of my dad's books? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, love, I love Thief of Time, but all, each of them has something really special. Um, I, love, I love some of the early ones. Listening Woman yeah. is, is really, really one of my favorites. Um, yeah, it's. I mean, it's like saying, so here are your here are your nineteen kids. Who's the best? You know, each each one of them had said something something really special to them. I wanted to uh, say say another thing before before we before we end this. I think because of the the pandemic, a lot of people have been doing more writing, and I I think it's really wonderful. I think there's. I mean, I know some of those manuscripts probably will only be read by the person who wrote them and maybe her husband and her kids. But I think there's just such, uh, I think writing is really important. If even, or I shouldn't say even if, I mean, I think telling our own stories is important. Family stories, you know, things that have happened to us as, as we've, you know, moved from teenagers to grownups or from midlife to to the, the in, ending parts parts of our lives. And I think, you know, even if you're not the best writer, it, the, it's just so valuable to, to record your stories for people who for people who love you or people, you know, years from now who wonder, you know, what was it like living through a pandemic or, you know, what was it like being the, the first woman who was elected as a district attorney or, you know, whatever the case may be. So I really, writing is hard, but I think it's really worth the effort. So I, I encourage people who want to write to give it a, give it a shot. Yeah. Try a diary or try journaling, you know, you don't have to make anything up, you know, and I, I'm going to take a charge here because I haven't gone to look it up and I really should have. But after that um, event that I mentioned to you where your dad and I wound up standing on stage talking to each other, he was invited to be one of the speakers at the Library of Congress um, a Festival of the Books in Washington. And he asked me to go with him because we'd already rehearsed. <laughs> so, you know, he didn't want to step out in front of another big crowd all by himself. And I said, sure. Um, and we went and it was um, the National Book Festival had moved on to the, the big lawn in front of, you know, the Capitol going all the way down to the Washington Monument. And it was, um, the time when the Washington sniper, the two shooters were very active. So um, it was a little unnerving doing it. And I remember 
before we stepped out onto the stage. So there were like thousands of people there ready to, to listen. Your dad looked at me and he said, remind me, he said, why are we doing this? <laughs> I, said, I said, we're probably safer than any other place in Washington, you know. But anyway, um, it was recorded and for many years, and I should have checked because I'm not sure, but it has lived that whole you know, time that your dad and I had together at the book festival lived on the Library of Congress website as a Library of Congress video. So I think if you were to go to loc.gov, libraryofcongress.gov and click on video, I think you could search for Tony Hillerman and if they have kept it, you could watch it because there weren't many recordings of your dad talking. At least I don't remember about his books. Do you remember? Were there? No, I well, I know he did something for the at the Los Alamos, the uh, Los Angeles Festival of the Book, right? And, and that was recorded, but no, I think you're right. I think that was before, you know, that was he. He's been dead now for ten years, and that was, you know, before when he was at his peak was before a lot of things were recorded. It was. Well, thank you for telling me that. I'll take a look at it. Well, yeah, I um, I'll look it up. And for those of you who subscribe to the Poison Pen E News, I can um, I can put a link into it. I I looked for it three or four years ago, and it was still there. And it was wonderful to see him. Um, and you know, because he he was a wonderful speaker. He wasn't just a wonderful writer. He was truly a wonderful and engaging speaker. And it was just a it was just a joy to listen to him. I feel so lucky to have known him a little. Lucky, lucky you to have been his daughter. Yeah, I agree. I feel, I mean, it was one of those blessings that I didn't really appreciate. I think it fully appreciate until I started writing myself. And then it just kind of dawned on me how lucky I was to have had such a wonderful father and mentor and inspiration to have, to have grown up with him. Well, I'm, I agree with your mother. I'm sure he'd be very, very proud of you for these wonderful books. Hold up Stargazer again so I can remind everybody that Anne has the reason she's, she has our books. That's the reason she has it. We don't. All of our books, hundreds of them, are over there in Santa Fe with Anne. But with luck, they'll be delivered today or tomorrow and she'll sign them. We'll have them by the end of the week. So I urge you to order one um, because even if you've never read one of these books, this is a perfectly good place to start. A lot of excitement, a lot of fun stuff going on. And, and thank you for sharing your publication date with us again. And I will see you this summer because we will be in Santa Fe and we'll go and have lunch and talk about stuff. Lovely. Thank you so much. And thanks to everyone who was listening. I really appreciate it. And I hope you enjoyed the book. Well, we do too. Thank you very much for joining us. There will be a podcast um, of this conversation available on the Poison Pen website tomorrow. And the video will live forever on our Facebook videos. So I encourage your friends to either download it or watch it and enjoy the rest of your evening. Good night. Good night. Bye. Hello. We hope you're enjoying our programs and podcasts with authors. We'd like to expand them and your help would be appreciated. Please make a donation at poisonedpenfoundation.org. 100% of the proceeds will go to help connect authors with readers in this difficult time. Thank you.